Welcome to the Fit for Success podcast. Brian Semling is an experienced entrepreneur with over 25 years in business. He is the founder and CEO of Blitz Innovation. He has built several brands, such as Brian's Toys, a collectible toy business, to several Amazon FBA brands like Strictly Bricks and Clever Creations. His latest adventure is Rovox, a modern athleisure footwear brand which can be found at rovoxfootwear.com. On the podcast, Brian will talk with other entrepreneurs and social media influencers about their entrepreneurial journey, from what it takes to start and run a business to how they may continue to grow their brands and where they see themselves in their businesses in the future. And now, here's your host, Brian Semling. Hello, I'm Brian Semling, and this is the Fit for Success podcast. Today, our guest is Brock McGough, the founder of The Modest Man. Welcome, Brock. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on the uh, show today. Um, Brock, why don't you go ahead and just uh, get started by telling us about yourself and your business and how you got started. Yeah, we will do. Uh, first of all, yeah, just thanks for having me on. I was listening to a couple of your uh, episodes, especially your one with, I believe her name was Amira, the attorney turned blogger. Yeah. And I was, I was taking notes. Um, Some similarities there, right? Between you and her and your businesses, right? Definitely. And she had a couple, um, sort of a, a slightly different monetization model, which I made me think a lot. So, but yeah, I, I, uh, got started by an in internet years. I'm like a dinosaur. Like I got started back in, uh, 2012 and, um, I was working sort of a corporate job out of college. Uh, I majored in psychology, didn't know what I wanted to do. I got a job in communications, a little agency to be honest, didn't really like it. Uh, didn't feel like I was doing what I was meant to do. Uh, I didn't really enjoy going to work, uh, but I also didn't know what the alternative was. So I read a book called The 4-Hour Workweek, which I'm sure your listeners are familiar with. Probably a few of your guests have mentioned it. Yeah. And it sort of opened my eyes to the idea that you can, um, first of all, make money on the internet, and that will allow you to separate your income from your time. So you're not like, it's not like you spend an hour at work and you get paid for an hour and your location. So you can live anywhere and do some uh, geo arbitrage. So I read that book, started uh, sort of lurking on a lot of the online forums back in the day, like Warrior Forum and uh, a lot of the forums that talked about just like online marketing, content creation, um, affiliate marketing and SEO. Kind of just started teaching myself how to build WordPress sites and you know create content that ranked and got organic traffic. And I spent a couple of years learning as much as I could about that. Uh, at the same time, I was developing an interest in, in menswear, men's fashion. I was a very poorly dressed guy and I decided that I, I would like to improve my appearance. And um, those interests sort of converged with themodestman.com, which at the time was just a website. This was pre-Instagram, YouTube was just getting started. So it was very much just a blog. You know, fast forward to today, uh, I have a small team a small portfolio of websites and a YouTube channel. It's what I've been doing full-time for a few years now. What were some of the challenges that you faced in those first few years, uh, challenges that you had to overcome? I mean, the, the hard part about uh, the website business is just getting traffic. You know, that that's kind of the whole game is getting traffic. And once you have that traffic in the audience, there are many ways to monetize, uh, but it's hard to get the traffic. And if you don't have any money, you can't buy the traffic. So you have to figure out how to get it for free. The best way to get traffic for free is from Google. And so for me, the challenge was learning how to get organic traffic from Google uh, without any money. And so it basically just takes like elbow grease and time. I think probably the biggest challenge with SEO is while certain things remain the same, like if you create good content, supposedly you'll get traffic eventually the technicalities change all the time because Google's always tweaking their algorithm. And then people who do SEO are kind of always catching on to what works, gaming the system, and then Google kind of changes it. So uh, I remember one time, I think it was back in, I want to say 2014, uh, they released a big algorithm update. It was kind of their first big one that really uh, shook up the search results a lot, probably affected like a, a good portion of the internet. Yeah. And I remember uh, I had a couple of small sites that I was kind of experimenting with and they just got they just tanked, you know, they just went to zero and it made me think, you know, I was like, okay, I really can't, I don't want to try to game the Google algorithm. Like I want to figure out a way to build a legitimate audience with really good content and sort of um, create content that I'm proud of. And, and that's been a good long-term strategy. 
Gotcha. So did, when uh, the Google ranking, when the Google algorithm changed and you lost a lot, did you feel like at that point it, you were more trying to make it, you know, kind of game the system? Or do you feel like you had good content that really was just not getting recognized? You know, it was a bit of both, but to be totally honest, it wasn't great content. Like my, I wasn't really putting uh, the reader first. And, you know, in, in my defense, I think back then it was a little bit different because there wasn't, we kind of have a clear idea nowadays of like what like black hat SEO is or like buying links or using um, private blog networks or kind of everybody kind of knows what's like a sketchy SEO practice. Back then people were just trying anything. And I learned a lot too. Like it, even some of the stuff that wouldn't work today, it is interesting to kind of, to kind of experiment with and see what really works. And what Google says will work and what won't isn't always true. They right. sort of want publishers to behave in certain ways, but you know, even today, like the number one sort of factor for a website getting traffic from Google is how many links does that website have? And so there are different ways to get links. I think I, now I still focus on that. I just do it in a more sort of um, thoughtful way and, and probably ethical way too. Right, right. So you learn mm -hmm. from it and it, uh, yeah, no question. So mm -hmm. as, um, as you think about the future, what are some of the things that you look at? What are some of the directions that you see your business going in over the next few years and even out over the next five or 10 years? I think digital media is really, I mean, compared to other industries, it's still sort of the wild west, but it's matured a little bit. You know, we, we've seen some some pretty like high profile acquisitions, even for just affiliate websites. The kind of popular example is the wire cutter sold to the New York Times for $30 million. I think that was the first like high profile uh, sale of uh, an affiliate website. Affiliate website, meaning it's, it's a website that publishes content and basically makes all the revenue from affiliate commissions. You know, sure. people click on a link they, and they make some money. Um, since then, there's been a bunch of acquisitions, but it's matured a little bit in that like we, we kind of know how much a website is worth now, and there's a huge market for buying and selling these digital properties. And so when I first got into it, I sort of looked at myself as like a blogger, like I'm, I'm an individual person kind of sharing my thoughts and monetizing um, as much as I can. Now I look at myself as sort of like a digital property manager, and whether I'm building properties or, or acquiring them and sort of fixing them up it's very, very much like real estate. And so I have a portfolio and I'm sort of tending it and adding to it and trying to build assets that are uh, valuable for the long term, but also sellable. So I'd like to one day kind of be able to, you know, walk away and do something else. Right. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting, like trying to separate yourself from uh, the business so that you can operate, run the business, but it, it doesn't necessarily require you forever necessarily. So... Right. So you have a, a large presence on YouTube, right? That was kind of one of your, um, you've been doing that a while. So just tell us about how the response was to that platform and, um, and just how that's gone for you, generating content and, you know, getting the, the followers that you have, the views, the, the traffic, if you will. Yeah. I mean, I think it's tempting these days as a, if you're a digital media brand, no matter what platform you start on, it's tempting to try to be everywhere. Yeah. So if you have a website and you get some traffic, you want to be on YouTube and then TikTok comes out. You're like, oh, I got to be on TikTok now, you know, and Instagram and all this, you know, with your, with your brands, you probably, um, you probably feel some sort of, you know, a little bit of pressure maybe to sort of have a presence on all, all these platforms. Right. And it's hard. It's, it's hard even to have a, a meaningful presence on even one platform. I remember I had gotten to the point where I was making just a couple thousand dollars a month from the modest man.com. And I had gone to a conference and met a bunch of and menswear bloggers and YouTubers. And uh, this one guy, Aaron Marino, who's, who's a good friend now, huge YouTube channel. You know, he, he convinced me to get on YouTube. He said, you have to be there. Like it's, it is the platform for, for men's fashion. And it makes sense to me. It's, it's visual what we're talking about. So it makes sense to be on video. But I spent uh, a couple of years hyper-focused on YouTube, kind of let my website, um, you know, die down a little bit, uh, yeah. which in hindsight, you know, I'm glad that I have a presence on YouTube, but I still think that web traffic is more valuable than video traffic. And at least for my vertical, if you look at the, the value of a view on YouTube versus the value of a view on a website and look at the, the ad revenue that comes in, it's way higher on a website right now. Yeah, yeah. sorry to cut you off. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the revenue is higher on the, the web page versus the video? I actually don't know. I think video is catching up. And I think in some 
industries that has caught up, maybe even surpassed web traffic uh, revenue. But but in, in men's fashion right now, it's definitely higher on a website. Maybe the type of people that are reading websites are more affluent or, or something. Well, maybe a part of it too is they're on your site. They're not on YouTube. So maybe you have more... Um... Uh, ability like if they're on YouTube they watch your video and maybe they're more likely to move on to someone else's video I know they obviously could watch another one of your videos but if they're on your site there may be a little bit more of a captive audience I mean obviously they can they can leave the site but I don't know just thinking out loud here but um, but you've noticed yeah. from a business standpoint you're better off with that person on your website than on your YouTube channel so yeah and it kind of depends how you're monetizing I mean if, if you're just looking at ad revenue. So display ads on a website versus like pre-roll, mid-roll ads on a video. In my experience, websites are way more valuable. Same goes with affiliate. You know, if someone watches a YouTube video, very little chance they're going to go look at the links in the description and click on an affiliate link and go buy something. If you're about to buy something, you probably Google it, go to a website, click on a link and go buy it from Amazon. That website makes a little bit of money. So I think YouTube is still I love YouTube. It's still valuable. But for me, the monetization on YouTube is totally different. So YouTube is monetized through sponsorships and sponsored content. And it's very lucrative with that channel. But um, as far as just pure ad revenue, it hasn't been super important. Sure. Have you been able to get the sponsorships for your channel that make it lucrative or not necessarily? Rovox, where fashion meets fitness. Yeah, I mean, there are basically an unlimited amount of brand deals that come in through YouTube, and I turn most of them down just because of bandwidth. Okay, so there is the yeah. opportunity there, and that uh, that helps, you know, I guess supplement the uh, the ad revenue, which which tends to be less. Right. And it's still great. It's, it's a great, it, it could be a business by itself, you know, and, and I don't think I'll ever sell the YouTube channel. I could make a living from the YouTube channel alone, but I don't like that sponsorships aren't as passive, you know? So it's kind of like you do one and it, it can be, it's highly leveraged in that you can make a good amount of money from one video. Yeah. So you're, you're kind of, it's still time for money, but it's a good rate, but I prefer affiliate and ad revenue because it's passive and because it's passive, it's sellable. Sure. Yeah. For your channel, you're the spokesperson. You have to do the ad and it's not necessarily transferable or, or sellable. Not easily anyways, not in its current form, perhaps. Right. I, I say like one caveat would be, I know people who cover similar topics on YouTube and they've added e-commerce to their business. And for them, from what I hear, YouTube is very valuable as a content marketing tool to drive sales for products. So yeah. like for Robux, if you had a YouTube channel that got, that was popular and it covered footwear, that would probably be great. But if you're just looking to add revenue, it's not great. Right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, shifting gears uh, for a minute, thinking about business and all these different, uh, these different things that you're in the middle of managing. How do you keep, um, I guess, uh, an active or fit lifestyle kind of through, uh, through this? What do you do to, to keep yourself going and, uh, and fit? Yeah, it's been, you know, the big challenge has been I had a my wife and I had our first uh, child about five months ago. And so yeah, really? that's, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been a great five months, but also, man, like, I mean, you know, it's, it's a roller coaster and, and your sleep kind of suffers. And so it's, it's been tough to, to manage that triangle of like family work and, and fitness. So what I did to kind of mitigate that is I got a, a strength training coach when I, we had the baby. And so uh, I find that if, uh, if I am committed to a third part, party, you know, and said that I would go do this workout, yeah. uh, or, you know, paying somebody uh, I'll do it. So, uh, so I've gotten pretty into powerlifting for the past few months. Cool. Yeah. And it's, it's been fun. I've made, made some gains and gotten stronger before that I did, uh, I did Brazilian jiu-jitsu for a long time and, uh, that, that kept me in shape. That was fun. So for me, it's, as long as I have something that's kind of interesting and, and engaging, that doesn't just feel like, you know, slogging to the gym, I find that that's, that's enough for me to, to kind of stay yeah. in shape. Well, um, a little bit of, I guess, I don't know if it's advice, at least a story for what you potentially could do with your five month old growing, uh, five months is young, but you know, as my kids were like 
one, two, for sure three. Like I would work out in our basement and had an elliptical and we got a treadmill and got different, um, you know, dumbbells. And, you know, like just a, a small, you know, setup basically. And so I would work out with them, have the TV on, like they'd be hanging out in their, you know, the, you're probably a little bit young at the five month age, but where they're standing up and they can't walk around, but they can play with the toys around their, uh, they're kind of a captive audience basically as you work out and eventually mm -hmm. they get to be, you know, crawling around and stuff like that. But, um, so, so that I always kind of did my workouts and that way I didn't leave, it made it easier to carve the time out because I didn't have to leave the house and, uh, and so forth. So kind of like use that time, like the workout time was also family time at the same time is kind of my point. Um, right. what that eventually evolved into like 10 years later was I was a runner in, um, high school, cross country and track. And my daughter was going into sixth grade. We started running together and my son was, went along with us who was at that time going into third grade. And so we started running three, four days a week and getting her ready for cross country in seventh grade. And so now we just kind of have all done that together the last three and a half years. And it's been, now we run seven days a week and my daughter's going to state uh, cross country and track meets. My son won the, the nationals for the 3K out in Virginia Beach we were talking about a few minutes earlier. So it started from kind of just like a casual working out, you know, in the, the basement together to starting to run together to then like now I'm their assistant coach in uh, cross country and track and it's and it's taken on a whole life of its own, but it's fun and definitely keeps, uh, then you have no, no choice but to stay in shape. There's, you're just, so. Right. Trying to keep up, right, at one point. <laughs> so trying to work, I, that was a long-winded story there, but if you're able to work it in with your child and, you know, and or kids as they, as they grow up, then that kind of works, uh, works well for everybody. And there's no guarantees they're going to like to do what you like to do, but I, if they see you do it, they kind of like, they naturally kind of go along. I mean, not everybody, yeah. right, but they, they're going to more likely go along and be like, hey, let me try that, you know, so, yeah. So totally. So. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to get a, uh, I'd love to get her into some sort of martial arts or, or something, you know, if she wanted to, and then right. and then kind of join join her in that. But we'll see what she's into. Yeah, so that's funny. And you, I think that you like you can't like force somebody to love something, right? That that doesn't really work. But if they if she sees you doing it and you encourage it, and then you just kind of you know hope for the best. Like with my son mm -hmm. though, for a while, like I was training more with I was training with both of them, but then my son. Uh, when COVID hit, he wanted to just kind of do the elliptical on his own. He wanted to stay like fit, but not, um, he was just a little bit tired of running after a year and a half. And so he did a little bit, but after about three months, he didn't do much. Hmm. Then he came back and he was like fully ready to go, like kind of on his own. It wasn't like me saying, Hey, Eric, you need to go do this today. You know, it wasn't like that. It was just like, Hey, you want to come join us? And he's like, you know, I probably should get started here. I've got a uh, a season that starts here in a couple months. And from there on, like the flips, the switch flipped where he just has been, you know, pedal to the metal. But if I was making him like, Hey, you have to go do this. Well, that wouldn't have really, that wouldn't have lasted very well. Right. So it's, you, you kind of model, you, you do what your passion is. They see that in you and then you encourage it. And then, and then you hope for the best. And if that wasn't what they're meant to do, if they're cut out to do something else, then I guess, then you support that basically too. And, but maybe, maybe you get lucky and they, uh, they follow you, uh, follow you on. So, um, we've had a good chat here today. Any questions that I haven't asked that, uh, you wish that I would have? Hmm. You know, I feel like a lot of people ask, um, sort of like specific questions about money. Like, you know, like how, how long did it take to make this much money or like, how much money are you making? Or, and I, I, uh, I guess I, if, if you had asked those questions, I guess my, what I would tell myself when I was getting started or what I would tell somebody who maybe is thinking about getting into the online business, especially content is it depends on your situation, but if you're young, like if you're in your twenties or just or finishing up college or trying to figure out what to do, I wouldn't think too much about that. Like I wouldn't think too much about how much money can I make in my first year of blogging or how much money is this YouTuber make or, or something like that. Because I think one of the things that, one of the mistakes I kind of made was thinking a little too much about the monetization and not, not enough about uh, what kind of life I wanted to have, what kind of person I wanted to be and like how I wanted to spend my time. And um, it took me a long time to sort of 
sort of craft like uh, you know a job for myself or, or, or a business that I really enjoyed working on. And um, I think it's important, kind of like what you were saying with with your with kids and fitness. Like you got to figure out what you like doing, and you got to go do that. And if you're good at it and you like it, the money will find you eventually. And I think, especially if you have kind of like a safety net, like if, if you, you know, grow up middle class or, you know, parents have a little bit of money or whatever, as long as you're not like really hurting for it, um, don't think too much about it. It'll come find you. Because I, I think these days with the internet, like no matter what your passion is, there's a way to monetize it, but you got to be, you have to be good. And, um, and you can only be good if, if you're doing something that you love, because otherwise you won't have the endurance for it. Right. I think in your, to your point, if you're focusing too much on the monetization, you don't get to that, you don't get to that breakthrough of like what it is that you're best at or what you love because you get stuck basically before you get there. Totally. Yeah. And you can enjoy kind of the game of business too. Like that's part of it. I mean, I, I like that part of it. It seems like you do too, oh, yeah. but ideally you're kind of, you're finding some marriage between like business and something you're actually passionate about too, not just something, um, purely because it might, you know, be able to, um, make money. Right. Well, I started my first business, uh, which I still, uh, own and run Brian's toys, buying and selling collectible star Wars toys. And that was a hundred percent, you know, uh, before I started that business in high school, I had collected star Wars toys for a couple of years and loved it and knew about it and thought, well, I think I could try buying and selling these instead of working at the grocery store and let's see how that goes. And like you said, I had parents that I didn't have a major risk at that point. Like I, I lived at home. My parents were teachers and I could afford to, to fail basically. So, um, right. so that I kind of stumbled into by something that I just, uh, that I love from the beginning. But I think your point is, yeah, if you go that route versus just thinking, where am I going to make money? Go, you know, find something that you're passionate about, go do it. And then there's ways to monetize it. Just don't prematurely focus on the monetization basically. So right well good deal uh before we wrap up here let's just uh give our audience a chance to um to find just to be very clear as to where they can find you so the modest man.com do you have any uh any other uh properties that you want to um specifically call out yeah i, I kind of keep a list of my projects just at my name brock mcgoff.com i think your audience would be interested in um, fulltimeblog.com. It's the website that I use to publish income reports and kind of talk about the business of blogging. So if you want to know how much money I'm making from these websites and, and how, um, I think fulltimeblog.com will be really interesting. That does sound interesting. Cool. Brock, it's been so great to have you on the podcast today. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a lot of fun. I'm Brian Semling, and this is the Fit for Success podcast.